the Wave, a novel by Todd Strasser. This recording is of the foreword and chapters one through five. Forward. The Wave is based on a true incident that occurred in a high school history class in Palo Alto, California in 1969. For three years afterward, according to the teacher, Ron Jones, no one talked about it. It was, he said, one of the most frightening events I have ever experienced in the classroom. The wave disrupted an entire school. The novel dramatizes the incident, showing how the powerful forces of group pressure that have pervaded, pervaded many historic movements and cults can persuade people to join such movements and give up their individual rights in the process, sometimes causing great harm to others. The full impact on the students of what they lived through and learned is realistically portrayed in the book that follows. In addition to the novel, The Wave has been made into a one-hour television show for ABC by Virginia L. Carter, an executive director at Tandem Productions and TAT Communications Companies. This was written by Harriet Harvey Coffin, project consultant at the TAT Communications Company. Chapter 1. Lori Saunders sat in the publications office at Gordon High School, chewing on the end of a big pen. She was a pretty girl with short, light brown hair and an almost particular smile, sorry, almost perpetual smile that only disappeared when she was upset or chewing on big pens. Lately, she'd been chewing a lot on, on pens. In fact, there wasn't a single pen or pencil in her pocketbook that wasn't worn down on the butt end from nervous gnawing. Still, it beat smoking. Lori looked around the small office, a room filled with desks, typewriters, and light tables. At that moment, there should have been kids at each one of those typewriters, punching out stories for the Gordon Grapevine, the school paper. The art and layout staff should have been working at the light tables, laying out the next issue. But instead, the room was empty, except for Lori. The problem was that it was a beautiful day outside. Lori felt the plastic tube of the pen crack. Her mother had warned her once that same day, that someday, she would chew on the pen until it splintered and a long plastic shard would large, lodge in her throat and she would choke to death on it. Only her mother could have come up with that, Lori thought with a sigh. She looked up at the clock on the wall. Only a few minutes left in the period anyway. There was no rule that said anyone had to work in the publications office during their free periods, but they all knew that the next edition of the Gre Grapevine was due out next week. Couldn't they give up their frisbees and cigarettes and suntans for just a few days in order to get an issue of the paper out on time. Lori put her pen in her pocketbook and started to gather up her notes for the next period. It was hopeless. For the three years she'd been on staff, the grapevine had always been late. Now that she was the editor-in-chief, it made no difference. The paper would be done when everyone got around to doing it. Pulling the door of the publication's office closed behind her, Lori stepped out into the hall. It was practically empty now. The bell to change classes had not yet rung, and there were only a few students around. Lori walked down a few doors, stopped outside of a classroom, and peered through the window. Inside, her best friend, Amy Smith, a petite girl with thick, curly, Goldilocks hair, was trying to endure the final moments of Mr. Gabondi's French class. Lori had taken French with Mr. Gabondi the year before, and it had been one of the most excruciatingly boring experiences of her life. Mr. Gabondi was a short, dark, heavy-set man who almost always seemed to be sweating even on the coldest winter days. When he taught, he spoke in a dull monotone that could easily have been put the brightest student to sleep. And even though the course he taught was not difficult, Lori recalled how hard it had been to pay attention enough to get an A. Now, watching her friend struggle to stay interested, Lori decided she needs some cheering up. So positioning herself outside the door where Amy could see her, but Gabondi could not, Lori crossed her eyes and made an idiotic face. Amy reacted by putting her hand over her mouth to keep from laughing. Lori made another face, and Amy tried not to look, but she couldn't help turning back to see what her friend was doing next. Then, Lori did her famous fish face. She pushed her ears out, crossed her eyes, and puckered her lips. Amy was trying so hard not to laugh that tears started rolling down her cheeks. Lori knew she shouldn't make any more faces, but watching Amy was too funny. Anything could make her laugh. If Lori did any more, Amy would probably fall out of her seat and roll into the aisle between the desks but Lori just couldn't resist. Turning her back to the door to create some suspense, she screwed up her mouth and eyes and then spun around, 
Standing at the door was a very angry Mr. Gabandi. Behind him, Amy and the rest of the class were in hysterics. Lori's jaw dropped, but before Gabandi could reprimand her, the bell rang and his class was suddenly spilling out into the hall around him. Amy came out holding her sides in pain from laughing so hard. As Mr. Gabandi glared at them, the two girls went off arm in arm towards their next class, too out of breath to laugh anymore. In the classroom where he taught history, Ben Ross crouched over a film projector, trying to thread a film through this complex maze of rollers and lenses. This was his fourth attempt, and he still hadn't gotten it right. Frustrated, Ben ran his fingers through his wavy brown hair. All his life, he had been befuddled by machinery, film projectors, cars, even the self-service pump at the local gas station drove him bananas. He had never been able to figure out why he was so inept in that way, and so when it came to anything mechanical, he left it to Christy, his wife. She taught music and choir at Gordon High, and at home she was in charge of anything that required manual dexterity. She often joked that Ben couldn't even be trusted to change a light bulb correctly, although Ben insisted that this was exagger an exaggeration. He had changed a number of light bulbs in the, his life and could only recall breaking two in the process. Thus far in his career at Gordon High, Ben and Christy had been teaching there for two years. He had managed to hide his mechanical inabilities, or rather they had been overshadowed by his growing reputation as an outstanding young teacher. Ben's students spoke of his intensity, the way he got so interested and involved in a topic that they couldn't help but be interested in also. He was contagious, they'd said, meaning that he was charismatic. He could get through to them. Ross's fellow faculty members were somewhat more divided in their feelings toward him. Some of them were impressed with his energy and dedication and creativity. It was said that he brought a new outlook to his classes, that whenever possible, he tried to teach his students the practical, relevant aspects of history. If they were studying the political system, he would divide the class into political parties. If they studied a famous trial, he would assign one student to be the defendant and others to be the prosecution and defense attorneys, and still others to sit on the jury. But other fac faculty members were more skeptical about Ben. Some said he was just young and naive and overzealous, and that after a few years, he would calm down and start conducting classes the right way. Lots of reading and weekly quizzes, classroom lectures. Others simply said they didn't like the way he never wore a suit and tie in class. One or two might even have admitted they were just plain jealous. But if there was one thing no teacher had to be jealous of, it was Ben's total inability to cope with film projectors. While perhaps brilliant otherwise, now he only scratched his head and looked at the tangle of celluloid, celluloid bunched in the machine. In just a few minutes, his senior history class would arrive, and he had been looking forward to showing them this film for weeks. Why hadn't his teaching teacher's college given a course on film threading? Ross rolled the film back into its spool and left it unthreaded. No doubt one of the kids in his class was some kind of audiovisual whiz and could get the machine going in an instant. He walked back to his desk and picked up a pile of homework papers he wanted to distribute to the students before they saw the film. The marks on the papers had gotten had he had gotten had gotten predictable. Ben thought as he fumbled through them. As usual, there were two A papers, Lori Saunders and Amy Smith's. There was one A minus and then the normal bunch of B's and C's. There were two D's. One was Brian Amon, a quarterback on the football team, who seemed to enjoy getting low marks, even though it was obvious to Ben that he had the brains to do much better if he tried. The other D was Robert Billings, the class loser. Ross shook his head. The Billing boy, Billings boy was a real problem. Outside in the hall, the bells rang, and Ben heard the sound of the class door banging open and students flooding into the corridors. It was peculiar how students always left class so quickly but somehow arrived at their next class at the speed of snails. Generally, Ben believed that high school today was a better place for kids to learn than it was when he went, but there were a few things that bothered him. One was his students' lackadaisical attitude about getting to class on time. Sometimes five or even 10 minutes of valuable class time would be lost while students straggled in. Back when he was a student, if you weren't in class when the bell rang, you were in trouble. The other problem was the homework. Kids just didn't feel compelled to do it anymore. You could yell, threaten them with Fs or detention, and it just didn't matter. Homework had become practically optional, or as one of his ninth graders had told him a few weeks before, sure, I know homework is important, Mr. Ross, but my social life comes first. Ben chuckled. Social life. Students were starting to enter the classroom now. Ross spotted David Collins, a tall, good-looking boy who was the running back on the fo football team. He was also Lori Saunders' boyfriend. 
David, Ross said, do you think you could get that front film projector set up? Sure thing, David replied. As Ross watched, David kneeled beside the projector and went to work nimbly. In just a few seconds, he had it threaded. Ben smiled and thanked him. Robert Billings trudged into the room. He was a heavy boy with shirt tails perpetually hanging out and his hair always a mess, as if he never bothered to comb it after getting out of bed in the morning. We gonna see a movie? He asked when he saw the projector. No, dummy, said a boy named Brad, who especially enjoyed tormenting him. Mr. Ross just likes to set up projectors for fun. Okay, Brad, Ben said sternly. That's enough. A sufficient number, number of students had arrived for Ross to start handing out the homework papers. All right, he said loudly to get the class's attention. Here are last week's papers. Generally speaking, you did a good job. He walked up and down the aisles, passing each paper to its author. But I'm warning you again, these papers are getting much too sloppy. He stopped and held up one for the class to see. Look at this. Is this really necessary to doodle in the margins of a homework paper? The class tittered. Whose is it? Someone asked. None of your business. Ben shuffled the paper in his hands and kept handing them out. From now on, I'm going to start writing lowering, lowering, start lowering grades on papers that are really sloppy. If you've made a lot of changes or mistakes on the paper, make a new neat copy before you hand it in. Got it? Some of the members of the class nodded. Others weren't really even paying attention. Ben went to the front of the classroom and pulled down the movie screen. It was the third time that semester he had talked to them about messy homework. Chapter 2 They were studying World War II, and the film Ben Ross was showing his class that day was a documentary depicting the atrocities the Nazis committed in their concentration camps. In the darkened classroom, the class stared at the movie screen. They saw emaciated men and women starved so severely that they appeared to be nothing more than skeletons covered with skin. People whose knee joints were the widest part of their legs. Ben had already seen this film or films like it half a dozen times, but the sight of such ruthless, inhumane cruelty by the Nazis still horrified him and made him feel angry. As the film rode on, rolled on, he spoke emotionally to the class. What you are watching took place in Germany between 1934 and 1945. It was the work of a man named Adolf Hitler, originally a menial laborer, porter, and house painter who turned to politics after World War I. Germany had been defeated in that war. Its leadership was at a low ebb, inflation was high, and thousands were homeless, hungry, and jobless. For Hitler, it was an opportunity to rise quickly through the political ranks of the Nazi party. He espoused the theory that Jews were the destroyers of civilization and that the Germans were a superior race. Today, we know that Hitler was a paranoid, a psychopath, literally a madman. In 1923, he was thrown in jail for his political activities. But by 1934, he and his party had seized control of the German government. Ben paused for a moment to let the students watch more of the film. They could see the gas chambers now and the piles of bodies laid out like stove wood. The human skeletons still alive had that gruesome task of stacking the dead un under the watching eyes of the Nazi soldiers. Ben felt his stomach churn. How on God's earth could anyone make anyone else do something like that, he asked himself. He told the students, the death camps were what Hitler called his final solution to the Jewish problem. But anyone, not just Jews, deemed by the Nazis as unfit for their superior race was sent there. They were herded into the camps all over Eastern Europe, and once they were worked, starved, and tortured, and when they couldn't work anymore, they were exterminated in the gas chambers. Their remains were disposed of in ovens. Ben paused for a moment and then added, the life expectancy of prisoners in the camps was 270 days, but many did not survive a week. On the screen, they could see the buildings that housed the ovens. Ben thought of telling the students that the smoke rising from the chimneys above the buildings was from burning human flesh but he didn't. The experience of watching this film would be awful enough. Thank God man had not invented a way to convey smells through film because the worst thing of all would have been the stench of it, the stench of the most heinous act ever committed in the history of the human race. The film was ending and Ben told his students, in all the Nazis mur murdered more than 10 million men, women, and children in their extermination camps. The film was over. A student near the door flicked the classroom lights on and as Ben looked around the room, most of the students looked stunned Ben had not meant to shock them, but he had known that the film would. Most of these students had grown up in a small suburban community that spread out lazily around Gordon High. They were the products of stable, middle-class families, and despite the violent, 
violence saturated media that permeated society around them, they were surprisingly naive and sheltered. Even now, a few of the students were sta starting to fool around. The misery and horror depicted in the film must have seemed to them like just another television program. Robert Billings, sitting in the window, was asleep with his head between, buried in his arms on his desk. But near the front of the room, Amy Smith appeared to be wiping a tear out of her eye, and Lori Saunders looked upset too. I know many of you are upset, Ben told the class, but I did not show you this film today just to get an emotional reaction from you. I want you to think about what you saw and what I told you. Does anyone have any questions? Amy Smith quickly raised her hand. Yes, Amy. Were all Germans Nazis, she asked. Ben shook his head. No, as a matter of fact, less than 10% of the German population belonged to the Nazi party. Then why didn't anyone try to stop them? Amy asked. I can't tell you for sure, Amy, Ross told her. I can only guess that they were scared. The Nazis might have been a minority, but they were a highly organized, armed, and dangerous minority. You have to remember that the rest of German of the German population was unarmed, unorganized and unarmed and frightened. They'd also gone through a terrible period of inflation that had virtually ruined their country. Perhaps some of them hoped the Nazis would be able to restore their society. Anyway, after the war, the majority of Germans said they didn't know about the atrocities. Near the front of the room, a young black man named Eric raised his hand urgently. That's crazy, he said. How could you slaughter 10 million people without somebody noticing? Yeah. Brad said, the boy who had picked on Robert Billings before class, that can't be true. It was obvious to Ben that the film had affected a large part of the class and he was pleased. It was good to see them concerned about something. Well, he said to Eric and Brad, I can only tell you that after the war, the Germans claimed they knew nothing of the concentration camps or the killings. Now Lori Saunders raised her hand. But Eric's right, she said. How could the Germans sit back while the Nazis slaughtered people all around them and say they didn't know about it? How could they do that? How could they even say that? All I can tell you, Ben said, is that the Nazis were highly organized and feared. The behavior of the rest of the German population is a mystery. Why they didn't try to stop it, how they could say they didn't know, we just don't know the answers. Eric's hand was up again. All I can say is I would never let such a small minority of people rule the majority. Yeah, said Brad, I wouldn't let a couple Nazis scare me into pretending I didn't see or hear anything. There were other hands raised with questions, but before Ben could call on anyone, the bell rang and the class was rushing out into the hall. David Collins stood up. His stomach was grumbling like mad. That morning, he had gotten up late and had to skip his usual three-course breakfast to make it to school on time. Even though the film Mr. Ross had shown really had bothered him, he couldn't help thinking that lunch was next period. He looked over at Lori Saunders, his girlfriend, who was still sitting in her seat. Come on, Lori, he urged her. We have to get down to the cafeteria fast. You know how long the line gets. But Lori waved him to go without her. I'll catch up later. David scowled. He was torn between waiting for his girlfriend and filling his growling stomach. The stomach won, and David took off down the hall. After he was gone, Lori got up from her seat and looked at Mr. Ross. There were only a couple of kids left in the room now, and except for Robert Billings, who was just waking up from his nap, they were the ones who seemed the most disturbed by the film. I can't even believe that all the Nazis were that cruel, Lori told her teacher. I don't believe anybody could be that cruel. Ben nodded. After the war, many Nazis tried to excuse their behavior by claiming that they were only following orders and that they would have been killed themselves if they hadn't. Lori shook her head. No, that's no excuse. They could have run away. They could have fought back. They had to have, they had their own eyes and their own minds. They could think for themselves. Nobody would just follow an order like that. But that's what they said, Ben told her. Lori shook her head again. It's sick, she said. Her voice filled with revulsion. It's just totally sick. Ben could only nod in agreement. Robert Billings was trying to sneak past Ben's desk. Robert, Ben said, wait a minute. The boy froze, but could not look his teacher in the eye. Are you getting enough sleep at home? Ben asked. Robert nodded dumbly. Ben sighed. All semester he had been trying to get through to this boy. He couldn't stand seeing him picked on by other students, and it dismayed him that Robert didn't at least try to participate in class. Robert, his teacher said sternly, if you don't start participating in this class, I will have to fail you. You'll never graduate at this rate. Robert glanced at his teacher and then looked away again. Don't you have anything to say? Ben asked. Robert shrugged. I don't care, he said. What do you mean you don't care? Ben asked. Robert took a few steps toward the door, but Ben could see that he was uncomfortable about being questioned. Robert? The boy stopped, but he still could not look at his teacher. 
I wouldn't do any good anyways, he mumbled. He wondered what he could say. Robert's case was a tough one. The younger brother wallowing in the shadow of an older brother who had been the quintessential model student and big man on campus. Jeff Billings had been an all-conference pitcher in high school and was now in the Baltimore Orioles farm system while he studied medicine in the off season. In school, he'd been a straight A student who excelled at everything he did. The kind of guy even Ben had despised in high school. Seeing that he could never compete with his brother's achievements, Robert had apparently decided it was better to not even try. Listen, Robert, Ben said, no one expects you to be another Jeff Billings. Robert quickly glanced quickly at Ben and then started chewing nervously on his thumbnail. All we're asking you to do is try, Ben said. I have to go, Robert said, looking down at the floor. I don't even care about sports, Robert, Ben said. But the boy had already begun to move slowly toward the door.